All right, folks, welcome. Tonight we'll be talking about chimney fires. Uh, chimney fires are, of course, one of, uh, one of the most common types of fires that, uh, that we see. And uh, the one thing I've been noticing is that there is not a lot of information out there on chimney fires. As we were discussing before, uh, if you go to the back of your IFSA manual into the index, you won't even find uh, any entry on chimney or chimney fires anywhere back there. And uh, a lot of the material that I was able to locate online certainly was, uh, was not really strong material. So I thought it was important that we do something to kind of come up because fighting a chimney fire is very different, you know, in many ways uh, than structure fires, but it does share a lot of similarities. So I wanted to go through that and uh, kind of some of the, some of the things that are the same, some of the things that are different and really just focus on the chimney fire response today. All right, now let's see if I can get this moving. All right, so chimney fires. Uh, again, the most common cause of chimney fires is the ignition of the creosote in the flue. Um, similar to furnaces, uh, wood burning fireplaces and stoves are designed to safely contain our fires. Uh, fireplaces, uh, fireplace chimneys are designed to expel the byproducts of combustion, the smoke, the gases, unburnt wood particles, uh, etc. Um, and uh, when these substances rise upward by convection into the relatively cooler chimney flue, condensation occurs uh, and a blackish brown residue called creosote uh, is formed and that sticks to the walls of the chimney. Um, this creosote uh, which can accumulate in a lot of different kinds of forms. It can be tar-like, it can be drippy, shiny, hard, crusty, flaky. There's all different, uh, different consistencies you'll find with the creosote, but it's very, very combustible. Um, and so when it builds up in, on the inside of these chimneys, that's when fires can occur. Uh, and we're going to find creosote accumulations greater in, in uh, wood stoves and fireplaces that have, uh, you know, restricted air supply or maybe cooler than normal chimney temperatures, you'll see more of the creosote forming. Um, and this happens frequently when chimneys, uh, with chimneys that are on the outside of a home rather than those that run through the center of the house and the interior. You'll see a lot more of those temp temperature fluctuations. Obviously, if it's exposed to the exterior, it's going to cool down more rapidly. It's going to, uh, so it's going to have these higher fluctuations and, and as a result, um, more creosote buildup. The one thing that I would like everyone to take away from this discussion tonight is the fact that chimney fires are a fire in a structure, right? This is what we, what we do. We respond to structure fires. This is a structure in a fire. So restrictions in air supply in chimneys are a result of poor ventilation and that occurs when the glass doors are closed and the damper is not opened wide enough to let the byproducts uh, you know, travel rapidly up the chimney and be expelled from the house, right? In wood stoves, the restrictions are caused by closing the stove damper uh, or the air inlets too soon and too often. Um, there's other factors that can lead to creosote buildup, like failure to maintain, you know, proper, uh, a proper temperature inside the flue. Uh, burning wet wood is definitely a major cause, as I'm sure many of us are aware. Uh, or even a failure to clean, you know, your chimney on a regular basis. Creosote is going to form. Uh, if you have a wood stove out there, uh, then definitely you should be cleaning it on a regular basis, at least annually. Uh, and it's something that we should be enforcing amongst our residents as well. This is very important. So regardless of how it occurs, uh, the longer the smoke remains in the flue, the more likely it is that the creosote will form and eventually catch fire inside the chimney flue, resulting in a chimney fire. We'll talk a bit about the anatomy of a chimney. So chimney has, uh, you, know, it, you know, many of us have chimneys, stove pipes, uh, you know, the, which is a factory built uh, a chimney uh, in, in, their, in their homes, in their residence. Uh, just want to go through a little bit. If you see on the left there, we have a nice picture of a masonry chimney. Uh, also, you know, usually part of a fireplace when we have these. Um, so I'm going to go through a little bit just quickly about some of the different parts of it. Uh, so let's start it over with these. You can see the smoke shelf uh, on the masonry chimney. It's located between the firebox and the smoke chamber. Um, 
the smoke uh, so the smokes the smoke shelf's job is to collect any rainwater and debris that may enter into the chimney so you can see what the smoke shelf would do it actually would prevent us from being you know if we're dropping uh you know uh, or sleeping from down uh or drop or putting chemical or, or dry chemical or however we're uh, we're fighting this fire but if we're putting something down the chimney there is this smoke shelf that we are going to run in run across that will uh prevent us from getting all the way down unless it's able to navigate around that so the smoke chamber is uh, just above the damper, and you can see that you know basically where the smoke would uh, would travel to uh, on the on the picture there, uh, and it acts as a conduit for taking the smoke from the firebox up into the chimney. Uh, the surfaces of the smoke chamber should be smooth enough to allow for efficient drafting, uh, and if this if the surface if the surfaces become rough with age, drafting now can be impaired and excess flammable creosote can begin to build up. Right, so as it ages, you're going to have more uh, cracks forming areas for these creosote deposits to really start building up. Uh, it's estimated that about 60% of chimney fires start in the smoke chamber. All right, so that is one place uh, to be aware that that's where these fires are starting. The chimney flue uh, is inside the chimney. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, it's a narrow path vent, uh, a narrow vent path that's running uh, from the smoke chamber uh, to the outside of the house. For safety, many of the flues contain uh, what's called chimney liners, flue liners, uh, and what that does is help channel the smoke out of the home and it protects the masonry of the chimney from dampness, acids, and intense heat. And the chimney liner is typically made of uh, um, similar to what you'd see those roofing tiles, those clay, like a clay tile. It, it looks like that and it, it's, it's basically just a square, like a, a square shape that fits on the inside and, uh, and lines the chimney to pr protect the bricks and, uh, and provide a smooth surface, less likely for creosote buildup in those cases. But with a liner uh, and with bricks, I mean, if, when the chimney, when the ch if a chimney fire were to start, these liners crack very easily. Uh, there are videos of that available on YouTube. You can see how these things work. Uh, but as they, uh, they can definitely um, cause, uh, uh, the cracking can now allow that, uh, the, the fire to travel elsewhere, uh, you know, into the, if the masonry isn't strong, if there's cracks in that, it can now get, and it now turn into a, a structure fire. So again, the material, the majority of these chimney liners are made up from, you know, aluminum, stainless steel, or the clay tiles that I was talking about. Uh, in other cases, you might find a poured in place masonry. Um, a clean liner that's in good repair will efficiently vent the smoke out and toxins out of the firebox and into the outside air. But damaged liners can lead to chimney fires and uh, the decomposition of the bricks and mortar that make up the chimney. Uh, damaged liners are also more likely to hold buildups of creosote, which can ignite and start a fire. So we look, go up to the top there and you see the chimney crown. The chimney crowns are cement structures that, ser that serve as a top covering for masonry chimneys. Uh, and that seals off the entire area except for the flue pipes. Chimney crowns protect the chimney bricks and mortar from rain damage. Um, chimney cap, and that uh, basically you can see the chimney cap on the stove pipe on the right there. Uh, and not all chimneys are going to have these, but the chimney cap would sit atop the chimney and acts as a guard against the rainwater as well as any other infiltration by uh, debris, including twigs, leaves from nearby trees and small animals like squirrels getting in, other rodents. Um, hold on a second here. Uh, and, you know, the rodents will get in there and birds will build nests in there if we don't have chimney caps at times. Um, chimney caps typically will have mesh, shot, mesh sides uh, and that's going to allow the smoke to draft out while keeping the outside elements from coming in. Uh, often these chimney caps are also going to include what's called a spark arrestor and that's just a device that's going to help prevent the sparks from escaping the chimney and igniting nearby combustibles starting, you know, the, the surroundings of your house if you're living in a forested area. Having a spark arrestor would certainly be very important. Um, something important to remember, a chimney catches on fire, a masonry chimney were to catch on fire, um, we need to remember our collapse zones, okay? That's, very, that's a very important tactical uh, consideration when we're at a chimney fire uh, that's a masonry chimney. Uh, and uh, for all of you, I'm sure many of you remember this, but your collapse zone is one and a half times the height of the structure, in this case, the chimney. So basically we need to keep that zone free of personnel as much as we possibly can. Uh, that one and a half times uh, on the ground from whatever the height of the chimney is. So the other photo I have there is of the stovepipe. Um, basically with the stovepipe, the flue can either extend up vertically through the ceiling or it can go out through an angle through an external wall. 
uh, or extend up through the up to the roof uh, through the inside uh, of, uh, of an existing chimney. Sometimes you'll put one of these stove pipes right inside of a chimney as well. Uh, but these are some of the basics, uh, the basic chimney constructions you'll find out there. So with a stove pipe, you might find you you might hear terms like uh, you know single, double wall, and triple wall, and and here's the differences between them basically. With the single wall, and you can see the photos here. Um, with the single wall, uh, you know it's basically it, you've got no insulation around it, right? And as you add you know the double wall, there's a there's a second level there, a second wall that goes on, allows for an airspace, which allows for some of uh, some insulation. And what that insulation does is is it it reduces those temperature flows, the, 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 those temperature swings we're going to get, the up and downs that are going to really cause the creosote buildup much quicker. Um, but there's a couple of other, you know, differences between these. So I'll go through them quickly. So with the single wall stovepipe, um, the main benefit of the single wall is that uh, it's less costly than a double wall pipe. Um, the single wall pipe also will effectively radiate the heat back into your room uh, because it doesn't have uh, that insulated extra area in it um, to, to prevent the heat from transferring. Uh, but we have to remember that with that, yeah, okay, it's radiating the heat back into the room. Uh, it also increases the chance of radiant heat transfer that will result in a structure fire, right? So that, that heat is now transferring very easily through this stovepipe. Uh, anything around the outside of that stovepipe, if there's some kind of external cladding there, uh, if it goes through a wall in any way and there's structural support somewhere close by it, uh, they're going to uh, be exposed to a greater amount of radiant heat uh, which has a higher risk uh, of, of transferring now into a, uh, into a full-blown structure fire. So that's the reason why a single wall uh, insulated pipe is going to require, you know, much greater clearance distances. Um, and basically what they say is around 18 inches, you'd have to have uh, clearance around the single wall pipe. But as we all know, uh, some areas in our, in our jurisdiction have, have, uh, uh, are uh, building inspections, some do not. Some places it's more the wild west and people are gonna do whatever they want to. So we need to be aware of that. Um, but people, but if they're installing a single wall pipe, certainly they're gonna need those extra clearances or they increase their risk of, uh, of having a structure fire. So with a double wall uh, stove pipe, the benefit of having a double wall pipe is that it'll last longer and your draft is, is, is going to improve. Um, the stove performance increases because the flu is going to have a higher consistent temperature with double wall versus single wall and it's going to produce less creosote. And then of course with the triple wall it's just an increase in insulation, maintains higher temperature inside the stove pipe, decreases creosote buildup again, and, uh, and decreases that radiant heat transfer to the structural components. So much, you know, gets safer and better for your chimney the higher, the, 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 uh, the, the more walls you add to, this, to your, uh, to your uh, chimney pipe. I'll quickly just talk on, you know, discuss this, you know, you, you're going to come across to chimneys without flue liners, some of them like the, the picture that you see on your screen there. Um, again, these we just increased chance of creosote buildup because they don't necessarily, they're more porous on the insult side and they don't have that smooth, uh, and so the, the porous uh, material is now going to attract that creosote more, it's going to build up more and uh, you can also see signs of deterioration and cracking. If that starts happening, uh, you know, basically you've got nothing in between that to, to stop the fire from and the heat from transferring. Uh, on the right there, I have a picture of some, you know, some exterior cosmetic covers. And sometimes you'll see people will put, you know, up a, a nice stovepipe. It has to travel so much above the, uh, above, uh, the peak of your roof. Um, maybe, but in, they look at it, they're like, oh God, that's ugly. Let's put some, something around it. So they put some nice pretty, you know, <laughs> uh, thing around it. I don't know if you call that pretty, but basically trying to hide it. Um, but the problem with these is they're always, uh, almost always made of combustible construction. And there is no easy access to get into these. You just have, if you need to check behind and, and see if there's been any, uh, you may need to peek and peel. You may need to cut into it, open it up to make sure that there's been uh, no extension into that uh, exterior cosmetic cover. Talked a lot about creosote, right? So, uh, you know, when one burns, combustion byproducts are produced and expelled through the chimney. Uh, the byproducts are gases, smoke, unburnt wood particles, water vapor, tar fog. Um, so as these substances uh, exit through the chimney, chimney is cooler and condensation is going to occur. 
Uh, condensation of wood burning byproducts results in this highly flammable creosote on the walls of the chimney liner. Creosote is mostly tar and is going to be, you're going to see it, it's either going to be brown or black in color and it's dangerous because it causes chimney fires. That's what's dangerous about it. So if you don't clean your chimneys, if you, if people in your, in your area are not uh, cleaning their chimneys, this is the kind of thing you can expect to happen. And you can see that's a pretty extreme uh, buildup of creosote on the picture on the left, but you can see what it looks like when it's on the, uh, when it's on fire on that photo on the right as well and how it burns uh, and gets hot all around basically. So the one thing, again, I mentioned it before, chimney fire is a fire in a structure. Um, and I think we need to, you know, to say it's only a chimney fire is uh, a little misleading. I don't, we should never assume anything. We get a call for a chimney fire in, we should be thinking structure fire. Okay, we need a response as we would for a structure fire. We're not going to send a single apparatus with a team down to that. We are going to send whoever shows up to the fire hall and, uh, and we're gonna get the trucks rolling because a chimney fire can turn into a structure fire very, very quickly. So the next thing I'm going to start talking about here, we'll talk about some of the equipment that we might need when uh, to, uh, to battle a chimney fire, all right? So here's, I've just made a little list of some of the, some of what we might need. Tarps, okay? Tarps are gonna be used and, and, and this is something that, you know, I want to, that I like to see when I come to a chimney fire and I see tarps down on the inside of the house. That is that value added, you know, the, uh, service that we provide as a fire department, right? This is about, you know, if somebody has a chimney fire in their house, they don't also have to deal with all the mess that comes from our cleanup afterwards. And as much as possible, by laying tarps down, we can limit that mess. We can provide, you know, run little runways for us to walk in on, uh, have, uh, have the tarps around. So if, uh, you know, uh, if we are either discharging extinguishers or having to clean out the, the firebox at all, uh, we're not spreading that around the inside of the residence. And, and, uh, and, and, the homeowners really appreciate that kind of thing, you know, trying to do the best we can to limit any signs of us being there, right? Uh, metal trash bin, uh, non-combustible trash bin, I guess would have been a better way to put it, but having a non-combustible trash bin uh, or a, a bucket pail of some sort uh, to remove the contents of the firebox and anything, any of the combustibles that may have been in there um, safely. A dry chemical fire extinguisher, uh, definitely something that, and we'll talk a little bit about uh, this in more detail when we get into the tactics session, uh, section. A thermal imaging camera. Thermal imaging camera is going to be used for overhaul. It's going to be used to find hot spots. It's going to be used to determine if the fire is completely extinguished and if any extension has occurred. So it's a very important tool to have with us on these chimney fires. Ladders, uh, and not just, you know, basically we would need extension ladder and a roof ladder, all right? Uh, so these the chimney fires are the one situation in the CSRD that we do say it is okay for you to go up on a roof. We don't put you on the roof for vertical ventilation. We don't put you on the roof during a fire in most cases, but a chimney fire is one situation where you may end up on the roof. So having your extension ladder and your roof ladder will be important. Chimney snuffer nozzle. I will go into more detail about this and talk a little bit about it. Some of your departments have these, some of you don't. Uh, this is a purpose uh, built appliance for a fire hose that would go on it and, uh, and uh, has misting ports that allow very fine mist of, of water to come out of it and helps with cooling. So we'll talk a little bit about it and I'll show you an example of that when we, uh, when we get there. Inch and a half, inch and three quarter, basically your, your, your quick attack char, uh, charged hose line. So one of your pre-connects needs to be out and it needs to be charged, okay? Uh, charged and at the front door. Uh, you might hear me repeat myself on a few things today, but this is one that I do want to mention. Uh, having that inch and a half charged hose line uh, is important because if the fire does trans, uh, you know, all of a sudden uh, transition into a structure fire, uh, we might need that and having that ready to go right off the bat uh, can definitely be the difference between saving and losing a structure. A mirror, and this is something that we don't all carry, is a, a mirror. Having some kind of, some, some kind of reflective mirror that we can use 
uh, once we've done what we can, we can use it and uh, in the firebox, actually put it in there, take a look, see if we can see up, up inside the chimney um, and see what's going on to check for any kind of hot spots. Now, the other good thing about a mirror is that if you're using a thermal imaging camera, you can actually, the thermal imaging camera will read the heat off of whatever is being reflected in the mirror, right? So that, so it can actually help you that way as well. But uh, yeah, I know most, uh, many of us don't carry these kind of things, but uh, it, it's, it's something to consider. Uh, if we were together, I'd ask you guys to consider and, and, and really we, let's, you know, to, to bring, like, think about what do we have? What does your fire department have uh, currently for chimney fires? Uh, what, you know, what do you need? Maybe uh, what do you think would, you know, make it easier and better for you, you guys to be able to do your job? Uh, and make sure that all of the, all of your gear, of course, as with uh, everything is, is, is in a state of readiness uh, in case the tones drop for one of these type of uh, calls. All right, I want to talk a little bit as well about the different assignments that you, uh, that, uh, that, that you may get on a chimney fire call. So this is important as well for incident command and for them to understand who, what kind of assignments you might get. Uh, if we arrive at a chimney fire call, what am I going to need? What kind of resources am I going to need? So, I mean, we can start right away with the idea of the incident commander. I mean, every call that we go to, of course, we're going to need that incident commander, somebody to have the overall command and control of the scene. They're going to use the incident command system. Um, if the safety, if, if, if they don't put a safety officer in, then they are the safety officer. And uh, also to manage the accountability board and, and, and maintain accountability for all of the members at the fire scene. All right, so the interior team. Um, basically, so that's the team that's going to be going into the building. Uh, we'd want to have an exterior or a roof team. Uh, and again, that's the team going up onto the roof. And we're going to want to have a support team. And I'm going to go through the roles of those three uh, in the future slides here as we go as well. And of course, we're going to need a pump operator. So again, the pump operator, pretty self-explanatory that we need somebody to run the pop, pump, supply us with uh, the attack lines with water. If we're pulling that inch and a half up to the front door, ready to go, and we want it charged, we need to have that pump operator there that can run the pump. And if you're running a snuffer nozzle, of course, another, uh, it's another appliance that's going to need a, a pump operator to help with. So the interior team, the exterior team, the, the roof team, and the support team. We'll go through a little bit, we'll go through those in a little bit more detail now. So some of the jobs of, uh, of the interior team that we should be thinking about, all right? Um, number one, put salvage tarps down. Now we talked about the tarps, we talked about putting them down, it prevents the damage to the floor of the house. Uh, and it can be the difference between a good experience and a bad experience for the homeowner, really. You know, uh, everything else is fine. Their chimney's in great, you know, it, 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 their chimney fire got put out. They're going to get the chimney guys out the next day, but they've got these bloody black boot prints going down their nice white carpet. Uh, so just be aware of that. Uh, we do want to keep our PPE on, but uh, by laying these tarps down, it really does help the homeowners. Interior team is also going to be responsible for extinguishing the fire using the appropriate tactic if we're doing one of the, ta one of the tactics uh, that is a bottom up tactic. Uh, there, are ta there are techniques as well for extinguishment that may be coming from the roof team. So again, it's going to depend on what the, uh, on, on what the size up is uh, and what uh, tactic you're going to be using uh, for that fire. Uh, but they might be the ones to, to actually extinguish the fire. Um, because it might not be advantageous uh, or possible to extinguish the fire from below, depending on the extent of the fire. Uh, we may need to follow up with additional suppression activities from above, and uh, we always want to monitor the effectiveness of whatever tactic we choose. Using a thermal imaging camera is a great way to do that as well. All right, removing combustibles using the, the metal bucket or pail, right? So um, obviously combustible buckets and trash cans are not to be used in any situation, uh, you know, to carry out hot coals and embers. Uh, I've been to too many house fires and structure fires that had, uh, you know, people cleaning out their house three days later, their entire place burns down because they put the plastic bucket with the coals that have been cold for, you know, three days. Uh, and, and even before, like, obviously they hadn't lit a fire that, you know, a couple days before that when they cleaned out their, uh, their wood stove, but, uh, there was still something in there, got going and ended up taking their entire house down. So never using combustible, always want to have a metal bucket or a trash can, uh, available for us to remove those combustible, the, uh, the, the fuel from the, from the, uh, firebox. We're also going to check for fire extension. 
uh, in, uh, from the interior team, they're the ones who are going to be inside. They're going to be looking around and, and, and see if there's, if there's any evidence that the fire has extended beyond uh, your simple chimney fire. Uh, use a thermal imaging camera. So going, going in with that thermal imaging uh, camera, um, listening for crackling sounds. That's a, you know, and it's, it's a really ominous thing when you're in there during a chimney fire, you can hear the crackling in the walls when, when, the, uh, when it's transitioning. Uh, so if you hear that, it's a, it's, a, it's a surefire sign that that fire is moving into the structure. And, uh, and with that, we want to, you know, with that checking for fire extension, we want to open the walls if necessary. We'll talk a bit about overhaul in this as well. Um, but, and we want to extinguish any hot spots uh, that we come across, of course, um, you know, really reduce that chance for a, re, uh, for a flare up or a rekindle. All right, we'll move on to the roof team. Um, so when we're talking about the roof team, they're going to access using an extension ladder, of course, to get up to the roof, right? Uh, but then we're going to be deploying a roof ladder to work from. We do not stand directly on the roof of the structure, all right? I did, that is just a no-no. We want to have that, uh, that roof ladder up. That's going to be another platform. That's going to be our working platform. We're going to do everything from that platform, all right? We try, if we need to step off for a second to, to, to remove a cap or something like that, it is quick. And we want to try and maintain our contact with that roof ladder and stay on it as, as much as we can, all right? So with the roof team, a couple things they need to do. Maybe they need to remove the chimney cap. Uh, it might be necessary to do that. So, so to go, when you're going up, bring tools with you in case you need to remove the chimney cap. You may need, you know, different types of screwdrivers, pliers, things like that would help you uh, get that off and maybe a pry instrument of some sort. It only needs to be removed, however, just remember, only needs to be removed if it's gonna be, if you're gonna engage in fire suppression activities from above. So you're doing the top down uh, techniques. Uh, so next, we're going to monitor the effectiveness of any extinguishing operations, and those would be the extinguishing operations from inside, right? So we want to see what that interior team is, if what the interior crew is doing is having the desired effect, right? We want to use, like, if we have a thermal imaging camera for that team, it's great for the roof team to have that as well. Um, but one thing you can really look for from the roof team is steam generation, right? If uh, it could be, you know, so more steam is good. If we're getting good steam generation, that means we're having an effect that, that the water is converting into steam, steam cools, steam expands 1700 times as we know, uh, it expands. Uh, so your little drop of water becomes 1700 times the size and displaces that much oxygen as it's traveling up the chimney. So. Uh, so watch that, report back uh, and, and report back to IC. Listen, let them know if you're seeing effective steam generation or, uh, or if nothing's happening, right? So again, using a dry chemical fire extinguisher or a chimney snuffer if necessary. So those are some of the uh, extinguishing techniques that can be used from the top down, right? We can use a dry chemical fire extinguisher. We can, uh, we can shoot it from above, uh, down the chimney. Uh, or we can use a chimney snuffer nozzle and I'll go into its operation a little bit more when we get to that section as well. All right, so I also mentioned um, a support team and the support team, I mean, again, this is not gonna be an exhaustive list because as we know, we go to a structure fire, um, you've done jobs at structure fires probably that there is no title for, um, but just understand that the support team is there to support, right? So some of the things they might do is help remove the debris after the clean out, the interior team might take the, the fuels from out of the firebox, put them in the metal uh, garbage bin, uh, pail, whatever, and the support team can help remove that and bring it to a safe location. Uh, pull a hand line. We talked about the hand line and making sure that that inch and a half was there. The support team can be the ones who actually grab that hand line, bring it and make sure it's charged and at the front door. They're doing that while you've got your interior team looking at their thing, your roof team getting set up to go up. Yeah, absolutely. Get the, get, you know, get the other folks to start uh, pulling that hand line and that charged hose line. Uh, may also need to pull the, uh, another uh, line for the chimney snuffer nozzle, depending on what your techniques are going to be. Support ladders. So again, you're supporting the roof crew by by assisting with the ladders. Get them to you know help them with the the raises uh, of the ladders uh, and the healing of the ladders. And then you're going to assist with the lowering of the ladder and placing it back on the apparatus at the end of the call. Ventilation. 
so at chimney fires, often you're going to find that the the that the residence uh, becomes uh, you know full of smoke, uh, and uh, we want to we do not want to obviously leave that. It's dangerous for us. It's dangerous for the homeowners. So we want to try and get that out. We're going to use a, a positive pressure uh, ventilation fan to clear the smoke from the structure. Uh, but remember, anytime we're using ventilation, it needs to be coordinated with the incident commander. So it's not something that we just go off and do. We never freelance. We wait until we get the orders and then we do it. And then the last one I have down here is assist with cleanup. Pretty self-explanatory. Um, and, uh, you know, I could have put it the, the other uh, one more line of any other duties as required, right? The, the typical on any of our uh, uh, job descriptions. <laughs> and uh, the reason why I, uh, I have to make coffee all the time at training. All right. Uh, just one question. Absolutely. So in this instance, uh, we're sending people inside. Do we have to have a team waiting outside or we can go ahead without that? No, they're not being sent into an IDLH environment. So, okay. right, we're talking about you're right, you're arriving at the chimney fire. Uh, you, you're going to you're going to talk to the homeowner what's going on. They're going to take you in. Uh, if there's smoke in the residence, wearing a SCBA would be important. Um, and in that situation, you know, get that get it ventilated as quickly as you can to try and get that smoke out. But again, if the structure is not on fire at that point in time, uh, the, the, it should be just wispy smoke and should be able to be cleared out fairly quickly. Uh, and in which case you can then doff your SCBA. Uh, if it's transitioned into a structure fire, then the regular rules apply, obviously. Uh, we're talking about a, um, an IDLH environment, immediately dangerous to life and health, uh, and uh, SCBA is required. And if we put a team inside, certainly a RIT team would have to happen in that situation. Does that okay, answer your question? Thanks. Good. Cool. All right, Sean, so. Just to clarify. Yes. Um, so in Ron's question, it brought up a good point that if an IDLH environment doesn't exist, then um, a chimney fire, to, it can be actioned by exterior level firefighters. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. 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 So an exterior level firefighter, it doesn't mean that you, you know, you, you, your head blows up if you walk inside a residence. The entire talk of uh, exterior firefighter, interior firefighter, revolves around this concept of the IDLH environment. Is it immediately dangerous to life and health, right? Uh, and in a chimney fire situation, that would not be considered an IDLH environment. It's a bit smoky, people might cough, that kind of thing. You're not going you're, you're to inha inhale enough uh, in a few seconds uh, that would necessarily be life-threatening. However, we want you an SCBA if there's smoke in there because the cumulative effects of this can be, you know, can be bad. But, it's, you know, but, that, but the, the important part there is the I, the immediately dangerous to life and health, right? We're not talking about long-term uh, um, uh, problems. We're talking about you take a few breaths of this, you die, right? Okay, so our tactical objectives. Uh, tactical objectives here are going to be very similar to what we're, we're going to have at, at other fires, uh, but, you know, maybe a little bit smaller and more condensed in terms of what we need to do. So, you know, our basic tactical objecti objectives here are pretty clear. We want to extinguish the fire, number one, right? Uh, and again, we're going to talk about how, that, how we do that. We'll talk about some of the, uh, of the different tactics that we're going to do, uh, use to extinguish that fire. Uh, so next I want to mention is limiting fire extension. So uh, our whole reason of being, the whole reason we have fire departments is, is limiting the, the, the damage that gets caused by fires. We're coming, we want to take, you know, the, the, the event that could lead to an entire loss of a structure. It should not if we show up in, in time and if we're called uh, to the scene on time. All right, so we want to limit that fire ex extension, but that also means time is of the essence, right? You come to a chimney fire, it's not time to dawdle around, it's not time to take your time. We have to get moving, we have to get cracking, because every second that we wait, more heat is being transferred and more risk to the structure occurs. All right, uh, ventilation as needed, right? Prevent smoke damage to the residents, so uh, that might be another consider objective of ours there. So overhaul to prevent rekindle, again, I can't stress this enough, the fire is not out until overhaul is complete. All right, we need to be doing a complete overhaul, checking for extension, looking around, is there any, is there any way that this fire got into the walls and could, uh, and could start the residence on fire? 
The last thing I have on here is salvage. Salvage, however, of course, is an action of opportunity. We do salvage when we can, which means we want to, you know, if if it's if there are uh, if there are personal belongings that are uh, that are at risk of being destroyed, we want to save them as as time permits in a, in our tactical objectives. Anytime during the course of our call, we may be called to to do some salvage. If they've got right up again, you know, hanging on the chimney, maybe some uh, post pictures, uh, old wedding photos things like that, take them off, right? If there's a mantle piece, clear the mantle off, right? We want to salvage, we want to make sure we're not causing extra damage to, to their, their, you know, their priceless Walmart knickknacks or whatever it is that's up there. Um, so make sure that we're always uh, thinking that way. Uh, it, really it, it really does benefit the homeowner and they feel, uh, they feel a lot better, you know, when you go knowing that their unicorn collection is still intact. So when we're talking about tactic, tactics, I mean, everything, as we all know, comes down to the concept of the fire tetrahedron and, you know, basically how we are going to extinguish that fire is going to come down to this fire tetrahedron. Uh, you have the oxygen, heat, fuel and a sustained chem uh, chain, uh, chemical reaction that's going on. Interrupt any one of those. You remove the fuel, no fire. You remove the heat, there's no fire. You, you remove the oxygen, there's no fire. You somehow interrupt that, chemi that, that chemical chain reaction, there's no fire. So we're gonna look at the different techniques we can use. To the, and, and I'll discuss as well, what part of the tetrahedron here we are dealing with and how that's working. So, um, and the first one I'll mention quickly is just removing the wood and fuels from the firebox is ob obviously fuel removal. Now there's still a creosote inside, uh, which is fuel for that fire, but you've removed the extra fuel that's in the firebox that's feeding heat up the chimney and sustaining it. So that is one, uh, one step that should happen in just about every case uh, with a chimney fire is we remove the fuel from the firebox. So I'm going to talk a little bit about some makeshift firefighting aids now. Um, and I don't know if any of you would be surprised by anything that you see on here and any of the photos that I've put up here, but all of these up here are, are what I would call a makeshift firefighting aid that would, uh, they, they can assist you in, in, in early stage chimney fires. Okay. Um, again, these aren't going to be used if you've got the full rip roaring, it's going crazy uh, and transfer into the structure kind of situation. But if we get there early and uh, uh, often, and these are techniques that work really well. All right, all, and all three of these options that I have up here, I have, a, I have a tray of ice cubes, I've got a wet towel and I've got a glass of water. The idea is uh, basically we're working with the concept of thermal reduction, right? Heat reduction, we're reducing the temperature in that fire tetrahedron, removing that. We're also at the same time displacing oxygen, okay? And that's through steam generation. So let's take the ice cubes, all right? I, I love ice cubes. You take a tray of ice cubes, you throw it in a firebox, you shut all the air inlets down and you basically let it go. And what's happening at that point in time is you're creating, the, those ice cubes are melting and they're, as they melt, they're generating steam. So it's kind of like a time release steam kill. You are, as they, as they melt, the steam travels up the chimney, the steam has a cooling effect, it puts out the fire on the creosote, it also displaces the oxygen. Now there is, so basically there is not being fed the air that that fire needs to go. I have used this technique personally on so many fires and almost every one of them, it has been enough. There was one time I think I actually had to go on and take out a snuffer nozzle and go a little bit farther uh, beyond that when I didn't start higher. Right, um, but uh, but but this on the early stage fires nine times out of ten it's going to knock her down. All right. Um, basically, we want to monitor the, the roof team is going to monitor uh, the the steam generation. Watch the steam coming up again. Remember, it's expanding. It displaces the oxygen and travels up. The, and we want to make sure that it's working well. Um, after we're done that, we're going to want to check for extension using the thermal imaging camera. Um, so some of the advantages though, uh, to, to the idea of using ice, right? It's quick, right? Super quick. Just open it up, throw it in. It's inexpensive. It costs us nothing. It costs the homeowners nothing, but, and, and most homeowners have it and, and it's available. It's there. Most homeowners will have ice cube trays in their freezer ready to go. Um, it causes no damage, uh, by doing this technique. Um, and again, it's just something that people don't think about and something that I haven't seen that I don't see passed on enough. But, uh, but for me, this is one of the best techniques you can use. All right. So disadvantages, um, you, you might run out of ice before the fire is completely out. Right. And it's really only for those early stage chimney fires. All right. Um, I still might uh, end up having, you know, excess creosote buildup, get the homeowners to have uh, a qualified professional come in and take a look at it when, when they're done.
So the idea of the wet towel, same concept as the ice cubes, right? Basically, it's thermal reduction and oxygen displacement through steam generation. Uh, big words, but basically it just means it makes steam, oxygen go away, cools down. It's It, it just... Um, you, you wet the towel down, you throw it into the, into the firebox, again, shut down all the air inlets and let the steam generation occur. So basically it has all the same advantages and disadvantages of ice cubes where it's quick, it's fairly inexpensive, a little more expensive because you might be, you're wasting a towel in this situation. Um, there's really, you know, again, no damage from the steam generation that's caused. You do have some more fuel by the, you know, the, 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 the dry towel once it's, uh, <laughs> once all the water has gone from it, something else to take out of the firebox. Uh, and it uses something that most homeowners have available. Uh, disadvantage for this uh, is of course, as the, as the towel dries out, it can add to the fuel load, right? Now we've got something else on fire inside the fire box if it dries out enough to the point where ignition occurs. Um, I'm not as big a fan of this technique because again, you're wasting a towel. It's not quite, you know, it's not, and, uh, but it still has the time release. It still does the same idea. Uh, and I know some people who swear by it and use this technique a lot. Um, so again, it is an option out there. Uh, uh, my recommendation to you would be see if they have some ice cubes first, does the same bloody thing on a time release. And, uh, and you're not wasting one of, uh, one of grandma's good uh, embroidered towels. Uh, and then I also have, of course, a glass of water up there, same class of con concept of both, steam generation, thermal reduction, oxygen displacement. Uh, but of course, with the, uh, with the water glass, we don't have the time release aspect of it. You throw a, water gla a glass of water into a, into a firebox, close it down, you're not going to get the air intakes shut down quick enough if they're not already shut down uh, before that entire uh, glass of water basically, poof, converts into steam. And, uh, and travels up the chimney. And it's either going to convert to steam or like a, basically it'll rapidly convert some of it to steam and some of it will remain in there and very, very gradually convert to steam. Uh, in which case that, and, and that's, it's just not effective. The stuff that's remaining in the firebox, eventually it'll dry out, but uh, uh, it's just not quite as effective, right? So that time release aspect goes away, but now we're not wasting a towel. Now, you know, it is still something that uh, can be a quick, uh, quick initial attack on an early fire, just throwing a glass of water inside. All right, let's talk about dry chemical fire extinguishers. All right, um, so for those of you who've gone through the fire extinguisher component of our training, you know that a dry chemical fire extinguisher, the way that they work is by interrupting that chemical chain reaction that keeps the fire going, right? And from that fire tetrahedron we were looking at, that you know, used to be the fire triangle, they added this chemical chain reaction because that's actually what gets interrupted with these dry chemical fire extinguishers. Um, these can be used either from above, from the roof, or from below inside the house, um, depending on uh, you know, depending on what the uh, incident commander uh, decides, and uh, along with obviously the other firefighters on scene. Um, so some advantages of using uh, the dry chem fire extinguisher. Um, basically, it's minimal damage is caused by using these. Uh, there is still some. I mean, you're going to get the dry chem uh, around, so having those tarps down is important. Uh, it's quick. Uh, not, they don't take very long to deploy and they use equipment that, that's already found on our fire apparatus. We all carry fire extinguishers with us. This is something very, uh, very quick. We can just grab with us, bring it inside the structure. Uh, and if needed, we can then deploy the, the, the dry cam extinguisher. So disadvantages, messy. Uh, like I mentioned, obviously that dry chem gets everywhere, right? It gets in your mouth, your nose, everywhere. It gets all over all your, uh, all your, you know, princess pony knickknacks, whatever you have around the house. Um, so, you know, again, using tarps when you're going to use these is very, very, very important. The other thing to keep in mind is that dry chem fire extinguishers does not reduce heat in any way, right? You're, you're, you're just interrupting that chemical chain reaction. All the heat is still there, the fuel is still there, uh, and the oxygen is still there. All it needs to do is, just, is so, so it, there's a much bigger chance of flare up if we're not reducing that heat, sucking the heat out of it as much as we can some other way. Uh, there is a bigger chance that we might have a flare up. So just be aware of that. We're not looking at the hot fires that we're necessarily wanting to use this uh, exclusively on anyways. We might also need to follow up with something that is going to reduce the temperature there. Um, some fire departments, and I'm not sure, you know, if any of ours do or not, but I know some fire departments do carry with them dry, uh, dry, like uh, dry chem in little like sandwich baggies or some kind of plastic baggie. Um, uh, and they use these for chimney fires. It's kind of like a, they, they consider it's like a chimney bomb, right? So you'd go, the roof team would use these. They'd be on the top. You'd have to have, a, have the cap removed, of course. And you take this baggie, uh, the Ziploc baggie filled with dry chem 
and you drop it down the stovepipe or the chimney. Um, the idea being that the fire melts the baggie and the dry chem is then dispersed. Uh, I have used this technique and I'm not a big fan of it, but it, 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 it has some effect. Uh, the reality is the, the baggie is not going to melt. These, uh, these Ziploc baggies, although they seem really thin, I don't care how thin of a sandwich baggie you get, the fire is still going to take some time to melt through it. Remember, the dry chem is right up against it, right? So it, there's no oxygen uh, in between, <laughs> you know, where the, where the dry chem is and the baggie begins. So it does take time for that to burn through. So typically what's going to happen is it's going to go drop right down onto that smoke shelf, and then it's going to melt. And when it melts, the dry chem, the, the hot air is uh, from the, the, the chimney in the fire is actually going to distribute the dry chemical up the chimney. Uh, again, this technique takes time. We have to wait for the baggie to melt. We have to see what the effects are over time. We're not entirely sure, is it done yet? Is there more to come? Is there, you know, it, it is one for me that I found a little bit harder to control. But again, it's a good use of your, um, of your expired fire extinguisher dry chemical, right? It, it gives you something else. You could also take the baggie oh, and, and basically put it over top of the stove up top, open it up and let the dry chem fall down, right? And now you know it didn't have to, you know, it, but again, doing that only works if the fire is not shooting like a jet engine up the top of the chimney. You're not gonna be putting your hands over a really hot chimney fire that's coming up at you, right? So that is not a technique I would ever suggest when flames are still visible from the roof line. All right, so we're up to the chimney snuffer nozzle, the famous chimney snuffer nozzle I've been talking about a few times. Now, I, I know a few departments do have these now uh, because, well, we purchased them for three on the North Shore uh, this year. Uh, they were having a lot of chimney fires and, uh, and this chimney snuffer nozzle is a purpose-built appliance, goes on the end of either a booster line or a small uh, attack line, so an inch and a half or inch and three quarter, Typically inch and a half would be the biggest, but, uh, and the idea is, uh, you can see it looks like a little bit of like a missile, right? And it's very heavy, uh, so it's weighted. So the, so you can see how the firefighter on the picture on the right is using it. You take the, you ha it's, it's running, there is no on off on, on some of them. So you see that uh, basically once the line is charged, water is flowing. There is no way, there is no bail, there is no way to shut the water supply down except at the pump, all right? So the pump operator needs to be on it. Uh, good communications need to happen to use this, uh, but you take this and uh, you, you, you've charged your line, you've got the misting going, you, you, and you're going to slowly lower it down the chimney. As it goes down, this fine mist, so you've got very, very small water droplets, right? And that's the, the small water droplet takes hardly any energy at all, any heat at all, to transfer that into steam, right? And now it's created, so your, your steam generation is huge. Um, you're also, again, not, yeah, so I'll go through advantages. You're not using, you're using minimal water. Uh, so there's less water damage. You're reducing the risk of a flare up because it works by reducing the temperature. We are actually sucking the temperature out uh, and thermal heat reduction, right? Uh, reduces the risk of the flare up. Uh, this is very effective on larger chimney fires as well. So small fire, large fire, the, the, these uh, nozzles will, will work great. Um, and, uh, and another advantage is that the water supply on your apparatus is going to be sufficient. You are not going to need a thousand gallons, uh, even 500 gallons. I'd say if you used 500 gallons on a chimney fire, you did it wrong. Um, we want to use minimal water, create minimal damage, uh, so that the, you know, we're leaving the homeowner in as good a shape as we can when we leave. Um, I do know that, uh, that we did uh, use the chimney snuffer nozzle, uh, or our departments used the chimney fire snuffer nozzle on, uh, on the North Shore recently, and they found it excellent. Uh, and I've used these before. I really, really am a strong proponent of these. If the ice cubes didn't work enough, if the dry chem fire extinguisher wasn't enough, you still hear something going on in there, you want to reduce the heat a little bit. This is a fantastic, you know, and if the fire is even, you know, is bigger than, you know, you think you can handle with what, with the other techniques, this is a great tech, this is a great uh, appliance to have. Some of the disadvantages though, is that, you know, of course, it's an extra piece of equipment that uh, not all departments have access to uh, at this point in time. Um, but if you don't, you might want to consider it, might want to go on your budget wish list for next year, or, or if we can afford it this year. Um, and it is going to take a little bit longer to deploy than previously discussed methods as well, right? So it's not like just grabbing a fire extinguisher off a truck and, you know, pull the pin, uh, you know, pull aim, squeeze, sweep. Uh, this is just, you know, you've got to actually grab the line, you're going up, a, you know, up with a charge, up with the line, up to the, to the roof. It doesn't have to be charged when you get up there, but you are going to have to have it charged before you start using it, get the pump operator to charge the line, Make sure that all the air gets out. Once it's working, now you can put it down and then it's the pass down, bring it up, 
right? Bring it down, bring it up and do a few passes. And as you're doing that, more and more, you know, thermal reduction is occurring and, uh, and less and less chance uh, that you're going to have that flare up. So really neat little piece of equipment. For those of you who don't have it, I, you know, I'd, I'd recommend you looking into it and taking a look and see uh, if something like this might, uh, might benefit your department. And if you have it and you're not using it, again, I suggest that you try it. Uh, it is an excellent piece of uh, equipment. Uh, so if you're running a pump using one of those, um, how much pressure should you be running at? Oh, very little. You're looking at about 20 PSI, I think, if I'm not mistaken. Is there somebody on the call right now who can verify uh, what the PSI is on the snuffer nozzle? Uh, yeah, Sean, when we ran it for that chimney fire, we kept it uh, just just charged. Like we didn't even hardly put any PSI to it. Right. So when I say 20 PSI, that's very low, right? Um, we're looking at a very, it does not, uh, it does not take much pressure for one of these to operate. Sean, it's um, the regular, the it's 30 max is what it um, is. 30 max? Yeah, that's basically what it is. 30 max oh. is what they say from the manufacturer. Sorry. I'm still not wrong. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. Yeah. So uh, yeah. So 30 max is what uh, that was uh, Chief Vale out in uh, in uh, Nicholson. So for all of you uh, who were wondering, that's what you know, up to 30 psi. Uh, very very little pressure required. Sean, that yeah. the previous picture, it looked like the fire hose itself might have been a forestry hose. It was very small. And there, yeah, I think it's a booster line is what is what they're using there. So some departments have booster lines, some do not. Uh, but the chimney snuffer nozzles are basically made for either a booster line or for a uh, or for a small diameter attack line, like an inch and a half, inch and three quarter. Okay, thank you. Okay, um, I would say it's not a forestry line. I see, uh, and I, just because of it, it looks rubber to me, but again, the pictures are terrible. Uh, but yeah, no, you're typically looking at either a booster line or uh, or an inch and a half. All right, I'll move on to attack lines. Um, you know, this is kind of, we've been moving up and up and up as we go, right? Uh, those makeshift firefighting aid, aids are good for a, a, an early stage fire. Um, you know, we moving up to the chimney snuffer nozzle. Attack lines, obviously, put, taking an attack line and actually using it to extinguish a chimney fire is a last resort, right? Um, but again, it's going to work by thermal reduction, but you're going to get a heck of a lot more uh, water coming out of it, obviously. Um, just remember, though, the charged attack line needs to be pulled for, you know, should be pulled for every structure fire, ready in case, a, for every chimney fire, in case it turns into a structure fire. So let's always have an attack line ready to go. Uh, but it can also be used from the roof to extinguish the chimney fire. One thing to keep in mind, we do not want to fully open uh, the bale on the nozzle, right? Uh, we want to keep very little water going in. The more water we add, uh, you know, you're going to flood out that firebox quicker than you can uh, imagine. Um, so we're going to want to have it not fully open on the bale. We're going to want to use a wide fog um, because that wide fog, you're creating the smaller droplets of water that will convert to steam quicker, right? Uh, not going to be as, uh, as, uh, as effective as, as a snuffer nozzle in terms of, uh, you know, uh, water uh, conversion, in, conversion into steam. Uh, because again, you've got larger droplets of water, right? Um, it is going to have a lot more cooling power than a snuffer nozzle, though, because of those large droplets of water. Uh, and in, you, it's basically a deluge that will, event, that will eventually put it out. Um, but it's going to take more energy to convert those larger droplets of water uh, into steam, right? Even on the fog nozzle. Um, so you're going to have less steam generation and more of a waste of water, right? Uh, again, and by wasting water, that's when we start causing water damage inside of structures. We want to try to be as efficient as we can. Uh, but if your fire is getting out of control and ends up, you know, uh, looking like it's about to transition, this might be the option you need to go with. Um, another disadvantage we need to look at, uh, the thing, disadvantage would be the fact that it's not weighted. Um, so it might be, you know, and uh, in some cases it might be too large to fit down an entire chimney. You might not be able to get it down. You'll just have to be shooting from the top. You're not going to be able to feed it down like you are with a snuffer nozzle. Uh, and so, you know, you've got more water, uh, which is good, uh, better thermal reduction with that more water. So again, larger fires, this is what we do. Uh, but more waste of water, incomplete steam generation, uh, potential for more water damage uh, to the fireplace, uh, the wood stove, or the structure. 
um, difficult, to, and it's difficult to control the vo volume of water from the nozzle, uh, you know, exactly how you need it to be. Uh, so that's when you're, you know, this is when it's gone to a stage where, you know, if we're using this to, to extinguish a chimney fire, it's got to a stage where we're nervous that this is transitioning to a structure fire and has gotten very large to the point where our other tactics are no longer effective. And there's chimney, we also have purpose made extinguishers out there for, for chimney fires, right? Um, and typically these ones uh, are going to work by, you know, oxygen displacement. In some cases, uh, they may work by uh, uh, interrupting the chemical chain reaction as well. Um, the, you know, the one on the left there, the Chimfex, uh, it's been around forever. I, I've used them before. They kind of look like a, a road flare. Uh, and basically the way that they work is, is oxygen displacement. It, it will, uh, uh, you, it basically lights up like a road flare and you push place it beside the, uh, the materials in the, in the firebox, not in it. Um, and it discharges a chemical that basically displaces oxygen and puts the fire out, right? Uh, causes minimal damage, quick deployment. Disadvantages for this kind of thing, of course, are, you know, it's one more thing to keep on the truck and people forget about them. They don't use them. Um, uh, and it's, it's an additional cost. It's additional space. Uh, you know, so none of these am I a big fan of personally at this point in time, you know, our, our, our bread and butter techniques work really well. Um, there's also, you know, you can see on the right there, I put the, uh, the, the, what they call extinguisher bombs or extinguisher balls. They they, these typically will contain a, an, a, an ABC dry chemical. Uh, so again, works with the, uh, with the chemical chain reaction, will disrupt that. Um, and the way that these work is they, they basically explode when heated and that'll spread the dry chem and displace the oxygen when that happens. Um, there's some great videos out there of them working on structure fires. You've got a little, uh, you know, kitchen fire going on uh, that's basically a single room uh, uh, on fire at this point in time. You throw one of those in a window, boom, all of a sudden the fire is out. There's some great videos of how they work. Not as effective on chimney fires, though, the bombs. Uh, they, I, I've never seen them actually used for that situation, but I've heard that they've been used and some people swear by it. So just be aware there are different things out there. Follow the manufacturer's recommendations on how to use them if you are using those. Uh, but, you know, again, personal opinion is uh, these are just an extra thing to carry on a truck. If you have them, use them. If you, if you like them, again, I'm not stopping you, but my personal preference is not. All right, the last thing I'm gonna talk about here is just quickly, we'll talk about overhaul. Again, fire is not out until overhaul is completed, right? You've done a great job, you've come in, you've put some ice cubes in a firebox, hey, fire's out, we're all done. No, you're not all done. Until you've had a chance to look around the house, to take a look and make a hey, look wherever that, that chimney or stove pipe comes in contact with the structure and try to determine if there's been enough heat transfer that you have uh, and that you might have hot spots behind walls, in structural members, uh, in exterior, uh, you know, uh, cladding, you may have that. So we need to look around, right? Um, so not, a, but, and also inside the chimney, we want to make sure that it is out and that you're not, that we're not going to be called back for another chimney fire uh, in the same, in the same residence, right? So this is where your thermal imaging camera is going to come into play again, right? We want to use that thermal imaging camera. We're going to look around. We're going to see what we can see, um, any places where the, the stove pipe comes in contact. Um, and we want like use your best judgment about uh, what overhaul methods to use based on the size of the fire and the possibility of extension, right? Uh, our, a lot of you guys have a lot of experience. You've seen these things. Use your, use your experience, use your judgment uh, to determine how far we need to go with that overhaul. Um, there, in, in some cases, we may need to make some small exploratory holes. Uh, and what I mean by that is we just cut the little holes, like the one the little kitty's looking out of there and uh, um, basically take a look behind. What, what's going on there? Fire the thermal imaging camera, take a look. Do we hear crackling? Do we see anything? Do we sense heat? Um, and uh, if we do, extinguish any hot spots. Uh, larger overhaul procedures might be needed when there's no question that the fire extended beyond the chimney, right? We heard that crackling. We know what was going on. We may need to take more, like the photo on the right uh, of this slide, uh, and actually take a lot more of the wall and uh, surrounding area to make sure that we're putting it out. You can see the charred areas around uh, the structural members and the insulation that's charred in that photo alone, right? 
So we need to look behind. We need to uh, we we need to go as far as we need to go to make sure that that uh, that that structure isn't coming down. But again, that doesn't mean go straight to the picture on the right. If we can keep it small uh, when we're doing our looks, uh, you know, then then let's do that. And if we feel that we got there, and if we and, and if we're confident we got there quick enough, that there's little chance of uh, of extension again let's not necessarily go around poking holes into drywall for no reason but uh but it is something again use your knowledge use your experience and do what you need to do to make sure that fire is out right and the last step of all this before you leave hey, is uh, gonna be, what's that john sorry uh sean could you explain what's going on in that center picture the ladder team did they cut a hole in the outside of the chimney there or what yeah, so that would be uh, the cosmetic uh, exterior cosmetic cladding that we were talking about, right? Um, and uh, it looks like they've had to open it up using a saw uh, to get at the uh, the fire inside of that, right? So the fire is no longer contained in the chimney on that one. It has extended to this uh, to this uh, to this uh, cosmetic cover that's been put on the outside of it and uh, they needed to get into it for that. Again, I'm extrapolating. I wasn't at this call. I found this on the internet, but that would be what my expectation would be based on what I'm seeing here. Thank you. Okay. Sean? Yeah. In that same picture then, why would they go halfway up the chimney to do that? Why wouldn't they cut a hole in the bottom and put in some uh, steam characteristics, like shoot a hose up inside from the bottom instead of going hot three quarters of the way up the damn chimney to cut that hole right so i i you know the 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 short answer is i don't know I, again i found this on the internet i'm not there i'm not in the you know i'm not in the in the decision making team now what i can say is if they're what they're looking for here is extension right the, going from the bottom up is not going to work like think about a structure fire what you've got now is a structure oh. fire not a chimney fire right and, and a, te a technique where you're going into this exterior cladding and shooting up is not going to be effective, right? You need to get into the meat and at the seat of the fire, right? You need to, you be, you need to be able to get that uh, to be able to, uh, to extinguish. You're not going to extinguish it from either, you know, like you might be able to rain down on it a little bit. If they were to go a little higher, maybe raining down would be a way to go like a sprinkler, right? Um, but from the location that they opened it, I can say they have access. They, the water can get fairly easily to the bottom, fairly easily to the top. Um, you know, another thing that I would consider here, Mike, why, why do we stop there? Why don't we ask, why are they using a piercing nozzle, right? Um, that would be a, another go-to on this exterior cladding. The cladding is not thick. We can get a piercing nozzle, drive it into the side there, and, 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 and run it as long as we need to, right? That is a great tool for us in any overhaul, uh, including for chimney fire overhaul. So I, I can't explain why they did what they're doing exactly there. And I don't, I'm not using this photo as an example of what I expect you to do on a fire call. This is really just uh, uh, keep your eyes busy while I talk to you. <laughs> kind well, of I, I, I just figured with where they are, maybe with that burning like that, that ladder can collapse right into the chimney. And now you got a firefighter down inside of that chimney cover, right? You know, and, and, and I thought the same thing. That is, that, that's exactly right. Now, as far as why they cut there, probably because of what I was talking about, would I put my ladder against something on fire like that? Um, you'd want to be, I, I, I hope that I try to put it maybe just the side to it or something like that. But look at, you know, how are okay. they going to access there? It's, it's you know, I, I might have cut it into like into the side. And I don't know if you guys can see my, can you guys see my cursor if I put it up here, like where I am? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So I might have put it up on the side over here, right? And then I could have my ladder up along this wall, uh, as opposed yeah. to having them leaning their ladder against there. So good call, Mike. Yeah, absolutely. Safety officer, incident commander should be all over that. Cool. Thanks. No worries. So again, once we've done our overhaul, we're comfortable that we've done everything we can. That we don't think that 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 that, that we've gotten every hot spot. Uh, and, uh, and we're comfortable that we can leave this house as is. We're going to leave, but we're not going to leave until we've had the homeowner sign a fire watch, right? And we want to make sure they sign that form. So this is for the incident commanders out there. If you guys are running the, uh, the incident, make sure that before you leave town, you're getting them to sign the fire watch form. Uh, that just, all that does is make sure that they're going to have eyes on it every half hour. They're going to take a look, uh, you know, uh, and uh, uh, make sure that, they, that the fire hasn't flared up and that their home isn't at risk at that point in time. 
Um, there, it is a bit of a, a, a CYA, uh, cover your butt for us. Uh, and uh, that is, you know, we want to make sure that uh, we're doing everything we can before that. Um, but it's also good for them to know what their responsibilities are. And yeah, you know, things happen. We do the best we can uh, and we do a damn good job, but it uh, may end up, uh, you know, we may have missed something. We're not perfect. We're not infallible. In case we miss something, let's make sure the homeowners are on it. They're going to be checking every half hour. All right, folks. Well, again, chimney fires is, are among the most kind of common fires that we're going to be called to. Um, I just want to just reinforce that idea. We want to consider all chimney fires the same as we would. Uh, you know, it's a, it's a fire in a structure. Think structure fire, right? Um, knowing the proper uh, procedures and techniques to extinguish the chimney fire is going to result in better outcomes for our residents. And it's going to present, uh, prevent the, the chimney fire from transitioning into a structure fire and taking the entire structure. I encourage all of you to look at ways to improve your department's capabilities for responding to these types of fires and practice and, and, uh, and really keep, a, you know, keep, keep looking at new techniques. Make sure you've got what you need. Uh, and if you don't, go out and get it. Again, thank you very much, everyone, for, uh, for joining us this week. I'm going to stop the recording now. And if there's any more questions, we can discuss uh, as we go.